Meg Lafauve, uh, first off, uh, congratulations on your Oscar nomination for co-writing the screenplay for Pixar's Inside Out. Thank you. And you're credited along with uh, uh, Ronnie Del Carmen and Josh Cooley and, and the director, Pete Docter, is also one of the screenwriters. Uh, at what point did, did you become involved in this project? Uh, Pete was about a year and a half, maybe two years into the project. Um, and he had a lot of the elements, so he had chose, he'd done his research and chosen his five main emotions and Riley and new kind of places in the mind. So dream production, um, imagination land, but he was really starting to rethink the story and what story he wanted to tell in terms of who Joy was on her journey with. Um, so there weren't, the other story elements were things that we invented. So core memories and personality islands. So I was really brought in to help take the elements they had and, and find the story. And I've heard that a, a Pixar has a, has a pretty interesting collaborative process for, for developing its, its stories and its scripts. Uh, what was that process like, you know, once you got on board uh, working on this script uh, uh, in, that, in that group? Uh, well, it, it's an amazing process. Um, it was basically the four of us, so Ronnie Del Carmen, the co-director, Pete, uh, Josh Cooley, who was also the head of the story department for the, sh for the movie, and myself, and we would sit in a room and we would really break down the story and card it up on a big bulletin board and really challenge each other and make each other laugh and say, is that good enough? And really break it down and put it back up and break it down and put it back up um, over many days. And then um, at, that, at that point, we would then pitch it to John or Andrew Stanton to say, OK, this is where we are. Um, and then we would go off and write. And Josh at the first took headquarters, and I took what was happening with Joy down in the mine, and then we would flip pages back and forth. And Pete, of course, is coming in all the time as the director and writer himself. So um, it was an amazing process because in an animation you go to boards, but um, it was it was kind of the four of us made this kind of beautiful symmetrical kind of balanced team, um, and it, it worked really well. I mean, it was incredibly challenging. The story is incredibly challenging. Everything had to be invented. There was no template other than Pete Doctor's amazing genius head to go off of. Um, so it was a, a really challenging, you know, there's three levels to that story. There's Riley's story, what's happening in headquarters with anger, fear, and disgust, and then joy and sadness, and it all had to work together and be emotional and fun. It was, it was an incredibly challenging story. Um, to come to write and, and come up with, but um, I'm just so excited with how people are receiving it and getting it. Uh, with, uh, with, with such a complex story and a lot of complex sort of abstract ideas being sort of made literal in this film, uh, you know, did you, did you do any research or, or into psychology or into, into those sorts of things to sort of wrap your head around uh, this story? Yeah, Pete did a tremendous amount um, before I came. A lot of that year and a half was research, and they brought in a lot of experts, a lot of experts on emotion and psychology. And I know the art department also, of course, did incredible research into the mind. Um, when I came, they had really started to narrow that research down into their elements. So what I brought in terms of my own personal research was um, I had taken my kids to a preschool called Children's Circle, which was really about emotional intelligence and teaching children emotional intelligence and how to regulate their emotions. So all that I learned there, um, I really brought into the movie myself personally. For example, when Sadness sits next to Bing Bong and talks about him losing his rocket and just reflecting back to him how he felt, that really is coming right out of sitting in the sandbox at the preschool with my kids. Now, during a, you know, a new with a complex film like this, especially a film, you know, geared towards younger audiences as well as adults, uh, you know, during the writing process, was there a lot of, of concern and thought about making sure the film would be accessible to, to all audiences and maybe not too abstract when dealing with things like, you know, joy and sadness and imagination? Um, not too much. Uh, in you know, the, the bar at Pixar is always, what's the best story? Is this the best story? And that's the really the sole focus. Um, and but of course, um, that's something that Pete was thinking about. And they did screen the movie early on for um, children of people who worked at Pixar. And what they found is that kids, kids got it quicker and, and um, really understood it in such a wonderful way. Because kids really, they, they live in their emotions in, 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 in a way in terms of, so they were like, yeah, I'm sad. Like they really understood it. And, um, you know, they understood that, you know, that whole idea of who's driving. Like Pete tells a story about, one of the kids said to him, 
the father said later that his son had always wanted to jump off the high board and one day he did it and it, after he'd seen the movie and he said, you know, I decided to tell fear not to drive. And that's when we know, okay, kids get it in the most basic way. But I think the story is amazing because it works on so many different levels. So children understand it at a certain point and then adults or older children can bring in a whole other understanding or complexity to the story. So for example, Bing Bong leaving at the end of act two to a very young child they haven't experienced hopefully incredible loss yet or the loss of their childhood they're in it so they experience that moment in a certain way whereas adults right who have we've had so much life experience and we really understand in a, in a more complex way what that sacrifice of bing bong is so that's why for me the movie was so exciting because it was working on many different levels uh, you know, you have the uh, the emotions that that govern Riley, the main character. Uh, uh, but really, it comes down to the the adventure between joy and sadness, yeah. uh, and them reconciling with each other in a in a way. Uh, tell me about developing the relationship between those two characters. Yeah, you know, when I came in, that was what we were just starting to do. It originally had been fear down in the mine with joy, but Pete said he realized that when. Joy brought fear back. He didn't know what he wanted to say about fear. There wasn't something, you know, inside of him to talk about, and that he realized joy, sadness is really what he um, wanted to talk about in terms of it connecting people and being something to allow into your life. So, you know, the the the, the first inclination, of course, when you hear that is, well, then they have to go find sadness. And I and I was like, well, sadness has to be on the journey. You know, she needs to be. If the thematic of the movie is accept sadness, we as filmmakers have to accept her and put her on the journey um, through the mind with joy. The trick, of course, is is we can't be ahead of joy and know that sadness is something that's needed. So she's got to be really annoying, right? She just has to be somebody who, from the moment you meet her, she is budging in to make a baby cry, right? Like, it's right there. She's already annoying. You're already in Joy's mindset wondering, wait, 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 why is this person here and why are they making everything so sad? So. Um, that relationship and then the trick with joy is you don't want her to be just too incessantly happy because incessantly happy people are annoying um, and we want people to love joy so her vulnerability and really that her happiness and her kind of let's go team was more of a default and a safety zone for her when she felt overwhelmed or vulnerable so it's kind of letting joy and sadness both be vulnerable both be deeply challenged and not quite fit together, not quite get each other, but as they go along the way, starting to, especially Joy, really appreciating what sadness was bringing and her capability. And what I love about Joy's journey is, you know, her entire intent is to keep Riley safe from sadness, right? No, she, no the deepest parts of Riley cannot be sad. And at the end of the movie, she literally does the opposite, right? She hands that over to sadness. Um, and I think that's a very moving part of the movie for a lot of people when she hands those um, core parts of Riley over to sadness. Yeah, and, and that's sort of a revolutionary concept. Uh, you know, I mean, animated films and family films, there's so much about joy and humor and laughter and, and, and comedy. And here's a film that's saying, you know, no, sadness is an important part of who you are. It's an important part of your relationships in your life. Uh, what was it like getting to that, you know, thematic uh, uh, sort of part of the film. Well, I remember when Pete, when I first started and Pete pitched me the idea that he maybe wanted it to be about sadness. And I, I remember thinking, sitting at that table, that is such a profound idea to put out into the world, to let that ripple into the world. Because what we're really talking about, right, is self-acceptance. You know, be where you are and accept you are angry, you are sad. And that by doing that, you allow the other person to have their moment. And what I love about the end of the movie is that by Riley being brave and saying to her parents what is truly going on, which is, you know, you want me to be happy, but I'm not, that allows her parents to also admit, hey, we're sad too. And that for them both to get really honest and authentic in that moment, and that creates connection and bonding. And I found that with my own kids, you know, you kind of want to be a perfect parent. But when I can finally admit, you know, mom's just really <laughs> freaking out right now. Mom just made a mistake or, you know, be, be where I am. You know, the moments that I've done that, my child, like my son who's 12, can rise to the occasion and come to me and put his arm around me, you know, and he can be with me. And so I, I've found that that uh, profound idea of be where you are um, really can connect and bond you so deeply together that um, it was, you know, it's not an easy thing. Film. It's not an easy idea to put in a film, right, in terms of keeping it entertaining 
and keeping it the plot going and all the rules, but it really was for me the guiding light of what, what we're doing and what we're driving to. Now, uh, Joy and Sadness are, are voiced by uh, Amy Poehler and Phyllis Smith, and Smith just won a, an Annie Award for her voice performance. Uh, w was the script written with actors already in mind so you were able to maybe tailor the script to them specifically? When I came on, they had um, really thought about Louis Black for anger, and Bill Hader was on uh, for fear, um, and Phyllis Smith, yes, for sadness. Um, Amy Poehler was not yet cast for joy, um, but once she was cast, it's, it, it is so much easier because she is just the essence of joy herself, and her joy is so giving. You know, her joy is so, it's not about her own self-happiness. It's about you. Can't you be happy? Let's all be happy. You know, so that was such a wonderful, effervescent giving kind of joy to write for um, that and, and she's such a genius herself and her ability and her improv was was so delightful so yeah it really I mean I think any writer would tell you it really helps to have somebody in mind that you're writing to absolutely it, it helps so much and Phyllis amazing I mean they're all so amazing um, Mindy Kaling um, to be able to write you try really hard to write in their voice right and then like any like any film, you let them inhabit it and become it and be part of of that process too and what they could bring. They brought a lot. Now, making an animated film, uh, it, it takes years, especially a, a large scale Pixar production like this one. Uh, is, is there a long stretch between when the script is done and the animation is complete, or or do the writing and animating you know process sort of take place in tandem? Yeah, no, you don't really want to be writing while you're animating. Um, not only because of the expense, but also out of respect for those animators who have worked months on that piece, and you can't just walk, it, it, it's, it's, it would be quite a feat, I think, to walk in and start reanimating something. I'm sure it happens, but it's not the ideal. So for me as a writer, once the, if the movie's been boarded, and it's been boarded by that meaning storyboarded, so it's not animated, but it's drawn, um, and that's done a couple of different times. Um, and then it starts to lock and things start to move into layout, which means it's starting to move, you know, this sequence is moving into animation. Um, once enough of uh, uh, those things have all started to move into animation and layout, I'm done and I, and I should be done. Um, but, you know, Inside Out has the incredible benefit of that Pete is also a writer. So as it's moving through animation, he can be tracking all of that and making any adjustments that he needs. It's, it's, it's interesting. So, like, what, what was... What was it like seeing the finished product after, you know, all that time working on the script and then it's animated and, you know, did anything about it surprise you or? or Everything. It's amazing. Those animators are so amazing and watching, you know, the expression on Joy's face and, you know, they created all these different ways in her construction of her eyes so that she could, they, they could get the most um, expression in her eyes and, um, yeah, it's its own new thing, right? Because when I saw it on boards, it was also um, scratch music and scratch dialogue, meaning it's not often the actors themselves, it's just you know, people from Pixar who are doing the scratch. Um, so it becomes this beautiful new thing when you see it in animation. It's exactly what you, 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 you had, it's, it's what you envisioned, it's what it was, but it's more, it's better, it's spectacular. It's like going into 3D or something. It's, it's an amazing experience to watch the talent of those animators and all the artists. But I think that's, even for a live action, it's the same, right? You hand a script over, and then there's this new thing is created and born. Uh, so every experience, like I am always thrilled. Uh, this is uh, Inside Out. It's only the ninth animated film that's actually ever been nominated for an Oscar for its screenplay, uh, and eight of them are actually Pixar films. Uh, what is it like to be in that sort of rare group of, of films to to get that kind of recognition for animation? Oh uh, well, it, it, it's amazing uh, and. It's an honor. It, it's also very exciting because to be recognized as storytellers that, I, you know, you, you, you worry that people think animation is for kids, right? And for the, the Academy and, and different groups to recognize that this film speaks to all people and is for adults as well, and that it was working at that level of storytelling and writing, um, that's what we talk about is, is so exciting not just for Inside Out, but for all of animation, that animation can be that and do that. Yeah, it's, it's interesting, given how much, you know, especially Pixar films have had success both critically and commercially, uh, you know, incredible critical raves for, for this film and, and other Pixar films, but it, it's very rare for them to get into, like, say, Best Picture, and, and they never really yeah. 
nominated for Best Director. Do you think that they really should get more recognition broadly than that? Than they, well, they yeah, of course, yeah. <laughs> I would love for Pete to be recognized as a director. He's an amazing, amazing director. And I've worked with live action directors too. He is, is a visionary director. Um, and I, yeah, of course, I, I think it was one of the best pictures of the year, but I'm biased. Um, you know, all I can do ultimately is really appreciate the response we're getting from people. Um, not just regular audiences, but the special needs community. The film has deeply impacted them in terms of the ability. Um, my son is a special needs child to talk to them and know what's going on. I had a woman at a function walk up to me just the other day and say that she's an emergency responder for LA County. And she goes in the day or night of the trauma and works with children. And that our movie has made her job so much better and easier because she has a common language now to talk to them about immediately what's happening, what's going on, who's driving, to try to immediately reach out and reach those children. We know when you hear stories like that, awards are great. Get Believe me, they're wonderful. But that is the real deep um, satisfaction that something has rippled out into the world that is being helping people. You know, it's really, it's helping people connect and reach each other. And so that to me is just, that's just been the best. Yeah, I hadn't actually even thought about that. It's, it, it really does seem like uh, a really useful, in addition to being a good story, a useful instruction manual in a sense of how to articulate emotion and how to sort of, you know, give that common language between people to say, you know, this is, you know, these are the different parts of me and this is what's happening right now, my this sad. Is what's happening right now. And, you know, people have owed up to me and said I'm a better parent because instead of now trying to make, try, change my child and say, you know, just jump over what they're feeling and try to get them to happy, I just say, who's driving? And we talk about it. And that, I'm just so excited about that because that's sometimes all a kid needs is just to be seen. And just for that, and for you to help them acknowledge their emotion and and work it out, and uh, that's just that's just I don't know. It's just, it's been thrilling. It's been so thrilling to be even a small part of that going out into the world. Uh, this year, you, you know, last year you also wrote the screenplay for for the Good Dinosaur, which came out last year, and and it's rare to have two Pixar films uh, come out in the same year. Uh, were you working on the two scripts at the same time? No, oh my gosh, that would have been crazy. Um, uh, no, what happened is in, uh, Inside Out was really coming to the end in terms of the writing. There was probably, I think, one more screening left. But again, Pete's a writer. Pete is an amazing writer. Josh Cooley is an amazing writer. So they were they were going to continue on with a couple of small things that we were still noodling around with. Um, and The Good Dinosaur needed um, me to come over. So I left Inside Out and went over to The Good Dinosaur um, and started working on that with uh, Pete Stone and Kelsey and, uh, and that kind of core team. And now you're uh, you're 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 attached to the the script for Captain Marvel, which is a uh, part yeah. of the ever growing Marvel Cinematic Universe, uh, yeah. and, it, and it's a pretty big deal. This one in particular, you know, it's the first female led Marvel movie with you know and with female screenwriters too. Uh, it has has that process of writing that started, or is it is it underway? Yeah, it's, just, it, it's just starting. I'm writing it with Nicole Perlman, who wrote Guardians of the Galaxy, and is one of the smartest most fun, amazing writers to work with. We are having a great time. Um, we're really at the beginning stages, just, you know, discussing and having that kind of wonderful soup of what it could be, you know, and throwing out ideas and making each other excited by ideas and inspiring each other. And um, so we're really just starting, really beginning, beginning. Now, you know, at this point with, with Marvel, you think there are so many films and TV shows, and they're all in some way, you know, big or small, they're interconnected. Uh, you know, it, I know. <laughs> has it required a lot of homework or, or research? Yeah, of course, yes. I mean, out of you know, if only you know, that would be my job, right? My out of respect for like this incredible canon um, that has been created. Yes, there. I've I've been reading a lot and reading a lot of comic books and watching a lot. I mean, ultimately, our story is our story, and we first have to be inspired by the story we want to tell. Um, and I'm incredibly lucky because Nicole knows Marvel inside out, upside down. So she can always, you know, be my touchstone um, to, on, on all of that. Well, uh, I want to wish you the best of luck on, on Captain Marvel and at the Oscars for Inside Out. Uh, congratulations on everything. Thank you so much. It was great talking to you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.